everyone. So welcome to the second lecture of the uh, amazing Saturday morning lectures, and thanks for organizer for inviting me to come here. But before we launch the talk, and uh, let me give you a uh, advertisement on the, the Simon Fraser University will hold. Uh, it's called Discover Physics Day next Friday, which is fun because it has free parking. And I heard that, that we have a new uh, uh, canteen that is uh, amazingly great. But in addition to that, um, we will have a lot of interesting physics and science talking um, on that day. We will have a talk uh, about the building protein motors and also another talk about Higgs bosons. We have many labs and observatory open that there's a tour guide to guide you through the laboratories. That's a talk you can have a chance to talk to your professors and also learn so what can you do with a physics degree? How can you earn big monies with a physics career? So um, if you are interested, please feel free to uh, um, go to this website to register. Of course, you cannot um, write down the website now, but uh, after a talk, just come to us and then we will happy to um, guide you how to um, uh, register it. So discover a physics talk next Friday is fun. It's, uh, it has free pizza, it has free parking, and also it has amazing physics talks. So you cannot miss them. So anyway, so um, yeah, today I am trying to um, share some uh, uh, interesting stories with you on my uh, research topics, which is on quantum technologies. So you may have heard about this work uh, many, many times recently, it's quantum. It's so amazing, and you heard that in some very uh, high-profile scientific journals like Quantum Satellites recently launched that they can do amazing things, and also some Googles and IBMs that all, after a couple of months they will announce they have some breakthrough in quantum computers that uh, they can say they have a very, very powerful devices. And then you can see lots of, lots of quantum happening everywhere, and outside science you can even see that on the battery, on the detergent, and even in the... Oops. <laughs> And even in the uh, movies, and whenever the, the scripter cannot under explain everything, and they just press the quantum button, oh, quantum is the yeah. solution of everything, yeah. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, not all the quantums you heard are really good quantum mechanics. We know today some of them are just trying to jump onto the wagon and get some attention. But on the other hand, there are really three something really interesting that's happening. So today, my job will be just to tell you so some of the quantum properties that you should be aware of and some of the technology that's arising from this amazing new quantum mechanics uh, 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 effect. So before I dig into the details, and then I first to distinguish what are quantums and what are not quantums. So for not quantums are everything that we see every day, such as um, chicken, the restaurant, cars, and everything we see every day. They obey some classic, what we call the classical physics, is the physics that we learn or we experience since we born. So everything is pretty intuitive. So uh, in the early so, uh, uh, um, 1900s, and then people tried to apply these uh, intuitive physics into some fundamental particles, such as uh, atoms, neutrons, photons, elementary particles like Higgs bosons and neutrinos that you have heard in fancy journals. But the strange thing is that they found that the intuitive classical physics doesn't apply there. So in fact, they found that these kind of fundamental particles are some basic particles. They obey a completely new kind of physics. So that's is what the quantum mechanics kicks in. We developed a whole new theory uh, and, and, and uh, physics to describe the properties of quantum objects. Before I take into details, maybe I just try to surface how much you have learned about quantum or heard about quantum. So what is the difference between quantum and classical? So anyone try to tell me what they know? Yep. Sorry? So nothing seems to be determined. There's so much uncertainty. Great. Yeah, this is one of the properties of quantum. So any other properties you can imagine of? Not really. So okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a tunneling effect. Oh, that's great. So yeah, it's, um, yeah. Sometimes it will be in this position. Sometimes it will hop to other position through some tunneling effect. So yeah, there are more and more of a quantum effects, and I have talked to many people, and some, some of these are probably they told that, okay, quantum is to be discrete, as the name suggests, and also it's applied to fundamental particles, so it means it's the low energy, it's small, and as um, the audience said, so yeah, it also have some great deal of uncertainty. So these are some properties of quantum that are so different from the classical object. But today I want to highlight just one main effect that is playing the fundamental role in quantum technologies is what we call a superposition. So why is that? So I use a cloud to represent a superposition because it is sort of a fuzzy stage. Um, 
But to understand that, we go back, we put our calendar back a century ago in the early 1990s, and early 1900s. So as then this gentleman, Stern Gellar, has done an experiment on the scan Gellar experiment. So what is that is just say, and they put two magnets together, but this magnets are, 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 are in a funny shape, so that the south pole magnetic field is a little bit stronger at the up and then the bottom. So that's what they do is um, they will send some atoms through this uh, inhomogeneous magnetic field, some magnetic field, and see what's going on. So this magnetic field is so special design, and also the atoms they found us they have some magnetic property. So you can really imagine it is just like a tiny. So every atom is a tiny magnet. So that have a north pole and a south pole, and we call this kind of magnetic moment a spin. There's just a terminology dragons, but uh, you can really imagine they every atoms are tiny magnets. So when they send the atoms through this uh, magnetic field, because the south pole is a little bit stronger, so if the magnet is the north is pointing upwards, it will just go up. And on the other hand, if the north pole is pointing downward, it will just go down. So this is the configuration of the experiment. They make some magnetic field, and they try to send some atoms through there, so that if the atom is pointing upward, it will go up, and if the magnet is pointing downward, it will go down. So that, that is a configuration. Then the next thing they try is what happened if I put an atom that's pointing towards the right? So what they will guess, okay, what will they see? So I will let you guess what uh, uh, is the outcome. So first, the atom will go upward. Second, the atom will go downward. And see, it will go somewhere in between, not the top, not the bottom, but somewhere in between. And D, it will go not passing through the magnets, but go, go bounce back. And yes, I am not so sure. Maybe it is sometimes up, sometimes down. So who say the answer is A, or who guess the answer is A? B, B, C, some of you, D, and E. Oh, wow, you know the answer already. <laughs> but at that time, the uh, scientists are not as smart as you. They think, oh, yeah. We will expect something in between because it is not up, it's not down. It will just pass through and land somewhere in between. But uh, interestingly, they found out that it turns out the atoms will either go up or go down. Yeah, some probability is not certain. Sometimes it will go up, sometimes it will go down. But it will never end with something in between. So this is a very uh, uh, interesting experiment, and it is not as what we expect from classical physics starts. So if you have something like in between of up and down, it should go somewhere in between. So from these experiments, they have three interesting or fundamental conclusions. The first is that they found that some, quantum pro some properties of these fundamental particles are quantized. So in this case of the spin, they found that every spin could either be up or could be down. It has not anything else. So it, doesn't have anything that's in between, maybe zero or something. It has either be up or down. It's quantized. Oops. And then the second interesting thing they found that, okay, but uh, we know that now the spins is not in up or down. It is in some funny right or in some arbitrary position, uh, 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 direction. So therefore, they invent that there is a fuzzy stage. They call it a superposition. That the outcomes could be both up and down when it's prepared in some, for example, the right direction. So here I use a cloud to, uh, 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 to denote the fuzzy stage, and there's a tiny number really does. That is what we call the superposition amplitude. It tells you that if we are going to measure the state, well, how, what, what's the proportion of the state that will be going up and going down. So in general, people found us, in, uh, uh, generally, if you have any atoms pointing towards an arbitrary position, it must be representable by a superposition on up and down. And the only difference is that their superposition amplitudes are different. For example, the spin rise will be 50%, 50%, but if you are pointing a little bit upward, it may be, for example, 70% and 30%. But any uh, quantum particles, if you have to describe the properties, it has to be in a superposition. And then the third main issue is they found that if you are trying to do a measurement, the measurement itself must destroy the superposition. It is not about uh, how good your apparatus is. It's something fundamental. Whenever you have a superposition, you measure it, you destroy the superposition. So one example is here. Initially, I'm in a fuzzy stage of superposition up and down. After passing through the magnet, I measure it. For example, it will go up. And hereafter, the atoms have to be in spin up. So every initial information about the superposition has lost because of your measurement. 
So it is a, has a fundamental a importance because it actually deals what we call the quantum no cooling theorem. If you have a quantum state, you measure it, and then you must destroy it. And then whenever you try to clone it, you must not succeed for 100%. So therefore, if you can put some information into your quantum state, no one can clone it if that one shares the same physics as us. So this is an important uh, consequence. So and then the interesting thing about superposition is that it can even be generalized to multiple particles. So in, in, imagine you have more than one atom. So how can you describe the state? So if you have two atoms, there are actually four different configurations, or you call for combination of the up and downs. It could be both up, it could be both down, it could be one is up when it's down, and the other up when it's up and the other is down. So in order to describe the most general situations about the atoms, we have to have a superposition of all of the four uh, 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 possibilities. And in general, it is no longer possible to describe only the properties of one atom only. In order to describe the state of the both atoms, we have to put both atoms together. And this effect is what we call the entanglement. This is a very important and uh, uh, kind of resource we will talk about later. So in general, if you generalize a whole effect to n atoms, you have more and more atoms. You will have exponentially more and more combinations of the atomics of the spin states. And in general, if you want to describe the state, you need to have a superposition of all of the exponentially many uh, 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 possibilities to include to describe the whole system. So here's a quick summary of what we have learned in some Stern Galactic experiment. So it's sending some atoms through the inhomogeneous magnetic field is a very, very simple setup, but at least we learned three important things. First, some quantum properties is quantum twice. Second, in order to describe the quantum state, we need to introduce a concept called superposition. That causes the, uh, uh, and all the important concepts of entanglement. And third, if you have measurement, you want to measure the state of the atoms or the fundamental particles, and then it must destroy the superposition. So I take a, take, uh, uh, take a quick pause here. Is there any quick questions that you want to ask? Mm, no. So, but um, I can see you have a little bit confused about that. So at the very beginning, so many people are confused about this uh, language. So the, uh, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, um, Strollinger, and then he tried to convince you or how to uh, illustrate what is the idea of a superposition. So he imagined a very accrued experiment that he put a cat, but he didn't do the experiment, he just think about that. And I'm sure that no cat is harmed during the preparation of this talk. So um, he put a cat inside a box, and then that box has a radioactive uh, uh, element that will emit some radiation. And if there's a radiation emitter, it will trigger a hammer that uh, uh, breaks the glass that contains some poison. So that's the cat will die after um, um, getting those, those, those poison. So, but um, he said that before we open the boxes, we are not so sure whether the, uh, uh, the radioactive device has uh, 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 decay or not. So therefore, we are not so sure the cat is alive or that. So before opening the box, he described that this, uh, uh, the strangest cat state is the superposition of dead and alive. It's both dead and alive. But however, once you open the box, we will verify that actually the cat is dead or alive. And then um, it's like we open the box, we destroy the superposition, and we know only one of the results is uh, dead or alive. So this is a good experiment, but it also sparked some uh, uh, scientific debate. Also, okay, is superposition is really due to ignorance? It's simply because we don't really understand what is going on inside the boxes, or there is actually something fundamentally different. So in a more modern uh, language, I always use this in my classes, the random McDonald's coupon uh, uh, theory, you can say hypothesis. So imagine you always get this uh, McDonald's coupon in your mailbox, and there are many um, different uh, deals on there. So that's you can always pierce all of the coupons and put in the pocket and randomly draw one when you go to the McDonald's. But if you don't look at the coupons, what coupons you are going to pay and then, does it mean that you are actually ordering something like a superposition of coffee and burger if you don't know what coupon you're using? Is that the superposition? And no. Um, so why is not the case? So because the, the physics are completely different. So first of all, I just introduce what people interpret of the difference between random McDonald's coupons and also the superposition. So for superposition, before the, uh, uh, we start doing some measurements, Quantum mechanics told us that we actually have a complete description about the state. So whenever you know this is the superposition you have, 
you have no extra information about the situation about the quantum particles. It is a complete information. So the probability only introduced when you try to do a measurement, and that measurement destroys the superposition, thus introduce the probability. But on the other hand, for the random maternal kill bonds, initially if someone prepared the atoms for you, it may be up, it may be down, it may be burger, it may be coffee. We don't know about that. And afterwards, um, the measurement is just refill the unknown information that you have missed. It tells you that it is uh, whether it's up or down, or it is burger or um, uh, coffee. So the two phases are completely different. The quantum mechanics, initially you have a complete information, but the measurement is, so the probability is introduced by the measurement. But on the other hand, for the ignorance case, the uncertainty is introduced from the very beginning that you don't really know what is in the atom. And the measurement just tells you more about the information. So, so in, intuitively it's different, but how can we tell they are really different? So it is, in this example, it's pretty simple. You just need to rotate the uh, measurement device by 90 degrees. So that's if you send in a right, uh, at times a point in right, you have 100% of chance that you get the particle going to the right. But on the other hand, if you have an ignorance case that so you don't know whether it's up or down and you pass through this device, you have a 50% chance of left and 50% chance of right. So therefore, in quantum mechanics, so we, uh, we have been very careful whether the probability we got is actually due to some quantum property or if just due to some classic ignorance where we are not just collecting uh, our data carefully. So and then the most general uh, uh, techniques to do that is to try different kind of measurement to try to uh, verify whether that this is really a quantum probability or it is just a classical probability. So I see here you have uh, many questions. Oh yeah, what's quantum probabilities? <laughs> classical probabilities, superposition, ignorance, what are those? So complicated. So why are you? So you are not alone. And uh, it is very uh, confusing even for one of the most uh, uh, famous or one of the greatest scientists in the, uh, uh, ever in the, on the Earth, which is Albert Einstein. So back in 1935, when Einstein see this um, quantum mechanics, he said, crap, this, what is that? And then, um, and then he, but uh, for Einstein, he is a great scientist, tried to come up with a scientific argument to say, okay, quantum mechanics is crap. So um, what he said is um, he believed that if you have a physical theory, you have a physics, a science, that can really describe what is happening in the world, then that physical theory should be predicting the situations of a physical object with certainty without disturbing the system. So therefore, there is no such thing as measuring and destroy the state. It just means that your measurement is not doing good enough, or in this case, you think the quantum mechanics is incomplete. Quantum mechanics is just a bad theory that it ignores some underlying physics that hasn't been discovered. So this is what um, Einstein believed. So to substantiate his argument, he come up with a thought experiment. Just think about an experiment, try to uh, support his idea. So he imagined that if there's two quantum particles, so that's quantum, what quantum people say, and they're in the entangled state in a superposition of both up and both down. So after they prepare this kind of atoms, they send the two atoms towards two different directions, towards two different galaxies. So because the atoms are traveling in free space, there's no disturbance to the atomic state. So there's no influence on the atom. So right before they reach the galaxies, they are still remain in a superposition state, this first stage. But however, what happens if you have one of the side do try to do a measurement? So all of a sudden, the state will go from a superposition state to a definite state such as the, on the uh, uh, left-hand side, it becomes an up. And if you do a measurement on the left-hand side, all of a sudden, the right-hand side will also be projected onto a definite state. So before the measurement, it is still in the first stage, but right after the measurement, no matter how far apart are these two atoms, it will become a uh, uh, definitely atomic state. So but Einstein saying it is not possible because in special relativity, he knows that nothing can be traveling faster than light. So therefore, no matter what kind of measurement it is, its influence cannot go through the past through the night years and immediately influencing the other atoms. So therefore, Einstein thinks that this whole description of superposition is wrong, and what quantum mechanics is really like, my 
in my phrase, it's really like a random McDonald's coupons. So the description or the properties of the atom should have been decided right before the atom is sent to a, two different galaxies. So the reason why we need to use some superposition is just because we don't know some underlying theory. But on the other hand, um, some of the founding fathers of the quantum mechanics don't like the idea. He, they really believe that the superposition is the right uh, uh, description of the quantum mechanics. So there have been like 30 years of scientific debates on whether quantum mechanics is complete or it is just an ignorant theory that it really neglects some underlying physics that we haven't discovered and what uh, Einstein called the hidden variable theory, some theory that we haven't discovered. So, but uh, later on, the uh, um, discussion has become sci uh, uh, um, philosophical and the scientists has more important thing to do than just to put it on shelf. After 30 years until a person called John Bell, I, I remember that it's, um, he is doing, thinking about this kind of philosophical question while he is on vacation. And then he just come up with a brilliant idea. Okay, we are scientists. If we have something that we cannot resolve, maybe we can just do an experiment to check with which one is correct. So this is a great idea. So this is what um, he proposed. So imagine you have this entangled state that I talk about. So it emits two photons or uh, two atoms and in a superposition state. And then now you have two uh, persons try to do some measurements on the uh, uh, atoms. So but the interesting thing now is um, Bell allows these two persons to choose these two, two different methods. Each of them choose um, two different methods to measure the atoms. And after the measurements, we know that quantum is quantized. So therefore, if for each of the configuration, they can only get uh, one of the results, either plus one or minus one. So this is a configuration of the Bell's proposed experiment. They prepare some atomic state and ask two persons to randomly measure it in some of the uh, uh, configuration they choose, and then they will get some, always get some result plus one and minus one. So then some Bell say, okay, you can do a lot of this kind of experiment and try to compute this quantity we call S. And what is that? It involves four terms, and each of the terms is what we call the correlation. So to uh, um, quickly uh, introduce what is that, is imagine you do this experiment, for example, A choose the configuration A1, and B choose the configuration B1. And they will get either result plus one, or minus one, plus one, and minus one. And after that, they will just communicate their results, try to compute the products of their result. If it's plus one times plus one, it went plus one. If it's minus one times minus one, it's a minus one. If it's plus one, minus one, it becomes minus one. They just compute their result, and they will try to find out the average of the product of their measurement outcomes, and it uh, 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 forms one of the terms. So they have um, two different configurations on each side. So they have four different configurations, and they have four different uh, correlations. And then they just compute the so they they do the experiment, call out the information about the correlations, and put into this formula. And that's what Bell uh, uh, suggests. So it is some complicated math. But what is the most uh, 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 important physics that you have to uh, uh, know is that it turns out this is uh, uh, this S term has some pretty funny property that if Einstein's hypothesis is correct that we are not quite sure what is going on in the quantum mechanics, and there is some underlying physics behind that hasn't been discovered. And John Bell found that this S will always be smaller than 2. So if Einstein is correct, this S has to be smaller than 2. But on the other hand, if you trust what quantum mechanics tells you, and we can always find some situation that this S property will be equal to 2, uh, it will be as large as 2 times root 2, which is larger than 2. So that is a very interesting experiment. They tell us that you don't know whether Einstein is correct or quantum mechanics are correct. You can do this experiment. If you all your experimental results show this S quantity is more than 2, which is likely that there is some upper physics that we haven't discovered. But on the other hand, if you find the S quantity that is larger than 2, it means that Einstein is wrong and the quantum mechanics, those funny superposition description is correct. So, what's the result? The result is this year's Nobel Prize. Um, just uh, announced a couple of days ago, and by uh, is, uh, the, the prize is good, went to Alan Aspect, John Klauser, and Anton Schreilinger. And for their work in building some experiment with entangled photons, they really create the state that is proposed by Bell's onto the photonic system, the optical system. And then they express the violation of Bell's inequality. That's pioneering the whole quantum information science. So they do many experiments to try to build the apparatus to test what Bell's, uh, uh, 
I propose it, and I quote one of the uh, more recent experiments that by Anton Tylinger, and they found that this S quantity is equal to 2.73, which is much larger than 2. And so the end result is Einstein is wrong. So we, there's no hidden variable theory. There's no fundamental theory that we haven't discovered about quantum mechanics. Everything we know about quantum mechanics can be correctly described by the so-called superposition description. That's a very uh, fundamentally important result. So, this was for the uh, first part of my talk, a quick overview of the background of quantum mechanics. I found that, yeah, you, although um, you see that there's Nobel Prize awards uh, and many experiments have done, but it seems to you that, okay, it's still very hard to understand. Superposition, collapses, and many, many other uh, uh, mysteries you heard about quantum mechanics. But then, uh, on the other hand, some of the other branches or the mainstream of quantum people are saying, okay, yeah, yeah, this is something hard to understand, but maybe it is time for us to move uh, forward to so just accept, okay, this is strange. We think, okay, we accept this is strange and try to think about how can we use, use the strange properties to do something more useful. So then in the second part of my talk, we'll talk about quantum technology. So after we know that there's a superposition, how can we use them? So right now in the field, I would say we have the three main pillars of quantum technology, three main application of quantum technologies, which is in sensing, increased sensitivity of quantum sensors, to computation, and also to, to communication. But this is far from an exclusive needs because uh, we are still uh, 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 keep looking forward to have some new application of quantum technologies, and there are really new ones such as a quantum random number generator, random radar, how to increase the uh, uh, measurement accuracy of telescope, and many, many more that is under this uh, developing. So this is a shortage of time. I only focus on two of the applications today, which are the computation and communication. So first of all, quantum computer. So before we talk about quantum computer, so what is a computer, we have to know. So um, generally, the so computer is not just about the laptop or desktop we have seen every day. But computer is, for simply say, it's just a device that processes data. You throw in some input data, it generates a result that you need. So therefore, by this definition, we can easily define what is an efficient, quantum, uh, sorry, efficient computer, which is a computer that can process the same amount of data with fewer resources. So then the aim of quantum computer is simple. We try to use quantum mechanics to improve the efficiency of a computer. So how can we do that? Let's take a look, quick look. Um, if you can do this, um, achieve this quantum uh, advantages, or so, so use a quantum mechanics to increase the efficiency, and people usually call it a quantum advantage or a quantum supremacy. So how we can do that? So here's a, one quick example. is uh, Imagine you have a one-bit class of computer. You have just one digit, zero or one. So therefore, you will have two results depending on you put in zero or you put in one. But in general, if you need to know both of the results, you need to run the computer for two times in order to get both the results of zero and both the results of one. But on the other hand, for quantum computer, we can prepare a state called superposition state. So thus, the input can be both zero and one. And by just one run of the quantum computer, it can generate the results of both the superposition of zero result zero and result one. So by just one run, we can get both of the results. And the most powerful thing is that this kind of idea can be extended to many, many particles. Imagine you have an n-bit class of computer. You will have two to the power n, exponentially many different combinations of inputs. In order to note all of the inputs, you need to run the computer for exponentially many times in order to get all everything of that. But on the other hand, for quantum computer, you can put every input into a superposition state, everything in a both superposition, uh, every combination in a superposition state, and you put it into a quantum computer, and you just need one run of the quantum computer, and it can instantaneously generate all the results that you want to calculate in just one run of the quantum computer. So that doesn't that sound like an exponentially fast computer? It's not just a just a faster computer, but it's exponentially fast computer. But just run, run, it can compute exponentially many results. Oops. But wait a second. We learned from the uh, uh, Soren just case experiments also, if we don't do the measurements, it is a superposition. And once we do the measurement, it can collapse the state to either dead or alive. And the same thing happens in quantum computers also. Even though the quantum computer can generate all the results at the same time, but when you try to read out the results, it just tells you one of the results. So it, then it doesn't sound to be very useful. It can generate many things, but it just tells you one. So you, just, you have many money, but you don't pay a penny. And um, 
So that's how could that quantum computers can be advantageous. And it turns out it depends on how you decide the algorithm, how you decide the software. So that the quantum computer, although it tells you only one result, but it tells you the most important result that you need and neglect other results that you don't need. It is the uh, idea of how to decide a good quantum algorithm. So here I have like one very quick example is what we call the Grover search algorithm. So it is an algorithm that tries to look for a, 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 a data from your database that you need. So one example here is that suppose you have a library and you want to look for a book that you like. So on Saturday morning, so no one likes uh, physics except in this natural and probably you would like prefer a manga. So therefore you go to the library and you want to look for a manga, uh, but um, there are n books in the library, there are many, many books in the library. So the traditional approach is you just look for the book one by one, check whether this is a, a manga or a general relativity, and after, on average, end number of checks, and you will finally find the manga. But if you are a quantum person, or you go to a quantum library, what you could do is to prepare you as a superposition and check all the books again, uh, together. And it turns out, Grover found that you just need to square root ends of check, and you will already find the books that you need. So imagine if n is a million, you have a million books, Traditionally, you need to check it for a million times, but um, with quantum computer, you just need to check a thousand times, which is a much, much faster uh, 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 device. So why quantum is useful here? Because a quantum computer here just tells you the information you need, which is where's the position of the book that you need. But it neglects some information you don't need, such as the first book is ENM, the second book is optics. Those kind of information is not your interest. You are just interested where the manga is. So that's why quantum computer can give you advantage. Although it just tells you one information, but that information is what you need and neglects all the information that you don't need. Apart from checking uh, or searching, there are much, much more uh, uh, type of quantum algorithms, such as some algorithms that break classical security code. Some of the recent attention on simulating chemical reaction is even some people try to use a quantum machine learning, try to speed up the machine learning speed. And in general, there is a zoo of quantum algorithms that summarize many of the algorithms that we need, and you can go to check out. And even recently, so the BC government established a quantum algorithm institute to try to link this uh, uh, established algorithm to uh, industry to try to look for good use. And of course, there are much, much more possibly for you to discover. So on the other hand, there's another application on quantum communication. And of course, communication is just sending the information around from one to the other. And there are two types of uh, quantum advantage people can call. So one is that they will increase the efficiency of co uh, communication. They can send more information by sending uh, 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 the same, same amount of bits and classical bits and quantum bits. But that is uh, fairly limited usage we found. But much more attention is paid to what we call the unconditional security, to increase the security of your communication. So how does it work? Oops. So imagine that you have two persons that try to communicate. So usually uh, uh, we have an iPhone and then the Apple will tell you that your message is actually encrypted and only the receiver can decrypt that message. But unfortunately in practice, what the assumption is based on some mathematical theorem that that is hard to prove and people just think that they are true. But um, in general, what uh, the eavesdropper or the hacker do is they just copy the message and even worse, they found out if you have a quantum computer with those seemingly exponentially large computing power, they can actually decrypt the uh, classical encryption uh, 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 skills and then to decrypt your information. So therefore, if you have some information that is sent by the current uh, uh, application of the uh, encryption uh, technology, with quantum com computer, it's no longer secure anymore. So therefore, we have the uh, temptation to move to quantum cryptography, to use a quantum to assist the security of your communication. So how we can do that? So imagine now, instead of using iPhone, you have a quantum iPhone, and then you are sending information with some quantum uh, 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 particles. So if there is no hacking, and then they will just uh, receive the information faithfully. But on the other hand, if there is some eavesdropping, and due to the no cloning theorem tell us that whenever you have a measurement, you must destroy the superposition. You must affect the quantum state. So therefore, by checking whether the information is correct or not, the senders and receiver will know that there will be a hacker or not. So that's this uh, uh, um, important point about why quantum is useful. It's because of no cloning theorem. No one can copy the message without disturbing the message. So therefore, by checking the message, whether there's a correct or not, we can know there's hacking or not. But of course, if, there's no, if there, we know that there's hacking, we won't send the message right away. 
So in practice, what people do is what we call the quantum key distribution. So instead of sending the message, we send in some keys. You can imagine that one of the sender will prepare some logs, the digital logs, and prepares also some keys to unlock it. And then he will just keep the logs and send the keys towards the receiver. So through the, the, the whole process, we, they assume that there's maybe some hackers in between that can copy some of the uh, uh, keys. But um, the crucial uh, importance of the, of the uh, quantum key distribution is that whenever there's eavesdropping, the receiver will know that there is a uh, eavesdropping, and they will estimate how much of the keys is lost to the hackers. So for example, in this case, um, the sender prepared five logs, and then after checking the device, you know, so, okay, um, the receiver says she received the five keys, but four of them are hacked. It's going to be copied by the hackers. But no worries, there's a trick to get rid of the uh, 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 stolen keys. So this is a question for you. Suppose you want to uh, send some information. You put the information inside a box, and now you want to use those logs to lock the boxes and send the information to um, to the receiver. But however, you know that four out of the five locks have, uh, four out of the five keys have been stolen by the hacker. So how can you lock the boxes in order to guarantee your message is secure to the receiver? Anyone try to guess? How can you come up with a scheme that with just four out of the, so with just one out of the five keys is secure, how can you lock the information and send it securely? Exactly, we can use all the five locks. <laughs> but, so because then we have five locks and we know that only the, the, the eavesdropper can only take four of them, so you know that at least one of them is secure. So therefore, you just need to lock all the five locks onto the, the boxes and send it to the, uh, um, the receiver. So even the eavesdropper have four of the keys, there must be one lock that he cannot open, he cannot open and then the message is secure. So the importance or the, the application of a quantum here is just, it allows us to know that how many of the keys has been stolen and how many keys have been secured. So by using this information, we can devise some scheme to guarantee that the message is secure. So here's the end of, near the end of my talk, and I just do another type of exper uh, advertisement on um, what um, the SF Simon Fraser University is working on this um, exciting new film. So one of the first group is uh, led by Professor Stephanie Siemens. She is working on a second quantum technologies group. So you can make, imagine second is like a crystal and then to what she is found is um, you can take out some atoms from the crystal and then they will become some dangling electrons and that electrons is a quantum particle that you can use to store your quantum information. And then in addition to that, that is an electron, so it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, you can interact by microwave and also photon, so you can control the information, you can read out the information, you can manipulate the data when you process the data. So the interesting thing about her platform is that it is actually, it set the world record of the longest quantum information storage time. It is about an hour in room temperature. It's amazingly long when compared to other uh, platforms that can only store the information for less than one second. And it's even amazing that this world record is not achieved by Harvard, not achieved by MIT, but is someone in DC in SFU. So the other um, research group in SFU is um, Professor Paul Hygen. So he is working in trap iron quantum computer. So an iron is just an atom that you take out some charges, so it becomes some, uh, take out some electrons, so you can some charge the particle. And then because it's charged, we can use some electro to put some electric potential to keep it in some stable position. So that we can shine some laser onto that to manipulate the uh, um, properties of the ions in order to encode some information inside the ions. So in fact, this trap ions is one of the most advanced quantum computing platforms that we have now alongside with the supercontinent qubits. Oops. So finally, it is myself. So I'm the theorist. I am doing some calculations only, but it also uh, gives us some freedom to study a wide range of things. So I studied the three, all three uh, pillars of the quantum technology. And from the studies, I will try to look for a platform to implement that. And on the other hand, I also studied the physics of different pro, uh, uh, platforms like trap ions, photons, spin ensemble, and mechanical oscillators. And from the physics, I will know that, okay, how good the systems are, how, what are the imperfections are there. And then to, to look, okay, you have some imperfection and how uh, that imperfection will affect the efficiency of your quantum technologies. So my goal is to how can we uh, is to uh, find out how can we use some imperfect quantum devices to build some useful quantum technologies. 
So in this last slide of my talk, so today I want to tell you a little bit about what should we care about quantum technology. So I introduce you a very old experiment as a staying like experiment that tell you actually quantum, part quantum systems have three distinct properties than the classical objects. First, some properties is quantized. That's what quantum this word's coming from, is quantized. But in addition to that, every quantum uh, state or the quantum properties has to be described in a superposition. And due to that superposition, it introduces a much, much more uh, 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 possibility and it is also the resources that give you the advantage in quantum computer. And finally, when you do a measurement, you will destroy the superposition. That gives you the low cooling theorem and guarantee the security of your uh, uh, communication. So, of course, there are much, much more uh, inform, uh, uh, technology that we have yet to discover. And if you have any questions, just feel free to send me an email and then we can discuss it. And finally, thank you for your attention.